Hey, give the uh, high five to the person next to you. Say, welcome to the house of God today. Say, I'm really glad you're here today. And uh, what a good day to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Matthew. And I'm going to throw out a disclaimer right away with you. And here it is. Uh, some days are lighter when I preach. They're more funny. Today is not a funny day. And uh, it's a challenging day, and it's an eternity-driven day, and I believe that there are people watching online, hearing the sound of my voice, that need to make a, a Christ-centered, a Jesus acceptance of him in your life. And so uh, I'm just going to tell you right up front, here's my goal. It's to come after you. Not like come after you like... I'm coming after you to, you know, but no, I'm coming after you with the gospel. And, and my goal right up front is to see you come to Christ today and to get water baptized on July 3rd. That's my goal. There's my intention. Okay, so some of you are like, you know what, I haven't accepted Christ yet. I'm coming after you. Some of you are like, well, um, I don't know if I have. I'm coming after you. Uh, some of you are like, I don't want to. Oh, I am really coming after you. <laughs> oh, man. So last week we, we started a series called Conversationalist about the parables, and, and uh, it's, it's where Jesus speaks in the parables. In fact, uh, Jesus often taught the parables, taught parables. He didn't invent them. They've been around for, for a long time, but he spoke about 40 of them in his life as in ministry. And so look at what was said in Matthew 13, 34. It says, Jesus always used stories and illustrations like these when speaking to the crowds. In fact, he never spoke to them without using such parables. I love that. And so what we understand a parable is, is if you're taking notes, it's simply an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And it means to, to bring alongside, to cast alongside, to lay alongside. And what, what Jesus does is he takes things that, that we do know and lays them alongside things that we don't know to help us have understanding. And so that's exactly what happens. I want to tell you a story I read this week, and it's a true story. Russell Conwell uh, was a man who uh, read much of the Bible and ha grew in a fascination with uh, the Middle East, and in the 1800s, he decided to visit the holy sites. And of course, there was no, no buses, uh, there was no, no commercialism there, and so he had to hire a guy, an Arab, by the name uh, of Ali Hafid. And, and what's interesting about that is he hired this guy, and uh, he, would, he would take them, and he would go... Uh, take the tents, he had the camels, and, and put the tent up uh, every night as he's showing them, showing Russell Conwell around. And what's interesting about that is, is he told stories for entertainment. And, and the story that I'm going to share with you is a story that Russell Conwell heard, true story, from this Arab that he hired. And it's a story that eventually Russell, Russell Conwell put into a pamphlet and in the 1800s sold 7 million copies, and he actually spoke 6,000 times about this story. And he took the proceeds from this and actually started Temple University in Philly, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Temple University. And it's this story right here, uh, Major University from one story. So uh, I, uh, there was a man in South Africa, this is actually Ali Hafid, not the guy that took everybody around. Ali Hafid was a farmer, and, and he worked really hard in the sweat of the day to feed his family uh, in South Africa. And day by day, he had a plow. He had a meager little, little field and some fields and a house and where his family lo lived in. And every day, he worked the ground, plowing the field with his ox, hoping to get enough for his family. And one day, a traveler came through and, and said, what a shame that you have to work so hard. Well, what a shame that you, you really don't see the reward of your labor in full. In fact, he says, let me tell you about what's happening in India right now. He said, in India, it's full of diamonds. He said, in fact, um, he said in, in the valley of the moon, which is between two mountains, he says you can go and you can literally pick up and harvest uh, these diamonds, holding them in your hand. 
And he says, man, I, if I was you, I would sell everything and, and go there and you'll be f- fashionably wealthy. Unbelievable. And so that night, Ali went to bed and, and he felt discontentment growing in his heart. And so what happened was, in the morning he woke up and, and he told his wife, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell everything we have. And, and I'm going to make us wealthy. So he took the ox, took the, the farmhouse, took the fields that he owned, and he sold it. And he stood in front of his family and said goodbye to them to go and, and look for the diamonds in India. Said goodbye and he went. And he went to India and found nothing. He traveled all of, of Europe and found nothing. And finally he ended up in Spain where he stood by a river and wrote his wife a note before he jumped in the river because he had no money to get home. He was completely at, at a desperate end. And he, he wrote his, his wife a note and says uh, this, that there are no diamonds anywhere in the world. And he jumped into the river and somehow that note managed to get back to his wife. As that was playing out, the guy who bought the ox and the house and the fields from Ali was working the ground. The same ox, same house, same plow. And as he was plowing, it was frustrating because there was these black rocks that kept getting in his way. And so as he's plowing the field, he's stacking piles of these black rocks. And and day by day, working the field. Same ox, same house, same fields. Piles of these obstacles One day he found a really nice one, a big one that he he held up to the sun and it would shimmer. And it was so beautiful that it had the colors of the rainbow. It was magnificent. And he took it home and put it in his little house on the mantle. And of course the priest came by to wish them, uh, to congratulate them for moving uh, and welcome them to the area. And as he's talking, he stops mid-sentence and he says, well, where did you get that? So Ali Ali told... uh, this new guy told the story about what was happening. He says, do you know what that is? He says, that's actually a, a diamond in the rough. You wouldn't know that unless you work it, unless you, you, you take the edges off. That, that's a diamond. And well, sure enough, they, they sent that diamond uh, to, the, uh, to, to a person who analyzed it in the, in the late 1800s. And it was worth the late 1800s, 25000 became one of the, $25,000 became one of the largest diamonds in the world and became the discovery of the Galconda mine in South Africa. And here it was that the guy who went and one guy went and looked all over the place for diamonds. Went to Europe, went, went to India and found nothing, finally taking his life only to have one guy buy what he had and there piles of diamonds, those piles were diamonds under his and I think about that story and I think about the reality of, of sometimes what, what we go and search for. And we, we, we go and we look in other countries and we look in, in our world and our lives. And what right we're looking for is right under our feet, right in our hands. And I want you to today to turn to the, the book of Matthew. And, and, and so many people don't know the unsearchable riches in Jesus, Matthew 13, we talked about the parables of the mustard seed last week, and there's eight parables in chapter 13, and it's two of the shortest in the Bible we're going to talk about today. And here's what Jesus taught, that, that finding the kingdom of God is like finding something of such incredible worth that you're gladly to leave everything else behind to get it. And and here's what I'm convinced of. The closer that you are to the treasure, the easier it is to miss. The closer you are to the treasure, the easier it is to miss. And I will tell you, so many people are looking for the meaning of life. They're looking for life and they're looking for satisfaction. They're looking for something that gives them what they're looking for only to search and search, only to have other people be right where they're at because there is value right where you're at. But the closer you are to something, to the treasure, the easier it is to miss. 
So we have, uh, here we have this idea of the kingdom of God, which is the rule of God here on earth, bringing wholeness by chasing out turmoil. Matthew chapter 13, here's what it says. Here's the two parables, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Something life-changing under his feet. Here's the other one. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Something life-changing right in his hands. The closer you are to the treasure, the easier it is for you to miss. The kingdom of heaven is like. The, th the life that God offers you is truly the treasure. Christ is truly the treasure. And I'll say right up front, you can search, search high and search low only to find that truly what you're looking for is present right in your hands or right under your feet. And I look at the gospel and I'm saying, man, help people to not miss the treasure. Help him to not miss, in the first story, it's interesting, a man stumbles into the treasure randomly. We don't know exactly what's, what, what he's doing in the field, perhaps he was hired, but he finds a treasure accidentally. And, and I, I look at that and I'll say, to you, it may seem accidental, but it's meant to be found. See, see I, I'll tell you that God will make sure in all that he is and all that he does that you don't miss the treasure that is beneath your feet. He will do everything he can do to make sure that it's closed and seen. That's what he's sure of. To him it was accidental. To you it may be accidental today that you stepped in church today on this day, right now, in this moment. But the treasure is meant to be found. Here, here's the second thing is that in the second story, a guy was, had made a lifetime of hunting treasure, right, a lifetime. And, and pearls were the most valuable jewel in the ancient world, mainly because they didn't have the diving equipment necessary to harvest them. And so any diamond that you had, or a pearl rather, uh, was, a, was a big valuable. And people would, because of, there was no banking system, they would put their valuable or their assets into a pearl. So a pearl was essentially a, a banking system. And so here is a guy that, try, that buys and trades, buys and trades, and finally there's something of immense worth in him, and he recognizes it. Uh, to you, something may seem worthwhile until you find something of real worth. See, see I, I'm convinced that, that that's the point, is that, that the older I get and the more pleasure I experience and the more joy I experience, I hold the kingdom in one hand, and then I hold uh, all the other things in my life in the other, and they just don't seem to measure up. Because now I am spoiled with true value and true worth in my life, and nothing else compares in this world to the life of Christ in my heart and my life. Isn't that true? It's like eating filet for the first time and you look at everything else and it's a downgrade. And here's the reality is that you have to make sure that you don't miss it. See, God wants you to find it, but you have to make sure that you don't miss something of immense value. So I want to go, I'm, I'm crazy today and here's why I'm crazy because we discussed already quickly two parables and I want to uh, supplement these two parables I know Get ready with three more parables. Yeah, yeah, we're going we're gonna to chase down five parables today. One-eighth of what Jesus said right now, right here. But I do that because I think it packages itself well in this idea that the closer you are to the treasure, the easier it is to miss. Well, let's go to Matthew 21. It's, it's, uh, this is where it starts, 21. And then 22, I want to catch you up to speed on what Jesus is experiencing. He had a rough day. Anybody ever have a rough day? This is probably the, the roughest week of Christ's life. The roughest. In fact, uh, what we see is it starts with the triumphal entry. And of course, on Friday, it ends with the cross. Uh, Jesus is entering on a donkey. And what's fascinating is because of who he is, 
he understands what's going on in the hearts of people. You remember this moment. This is what we call Palm Sunday or the triumphal entry. All these people are laying down their garments and, lay, and, and, and swinging the palm branches, crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us now. And what we talked about is that people weren't really looking for, last week we talked about people in this day weren't looking for a savior, they were looking for a soldier to rescue them from the oppression of Rome. But what, what's interesting is that they were celebrating Jesus, here's what is said, look at this, I, I've never uh, recognized this verse before, but understand the picture. Here is one man riding on a a colt of a donkey, and people, it's a celebrity entering into their city, and there's crowds of people saying, save us now. Look at what's said, Matthew 21, 10. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? Hosanna, but not knowing who he is. Who, who is this? Hosanna! Who is he? Hosanna! Who is he again? Hosanna! Hosanna! Save us! Do, do you see the, the juxtaposition here? This compare and contrast of what's coming out of their ma- mouth versus what they've experienced in their hearts. That they were declaring a saving that they themselves haven't been saved at all. And I will tell you that the closer you are to the treasure the easier it is to miss. How many times across America are people screaming on a Sunday or a gathering, Hosanna, but they don't even know who he is. Then he goes in, of course, uh, uh, looks like they're worshiping, but in their heart they don't even know him. Today, Hosanna, Friday, crucify him. Then he gets off on, on the colt and he goes in the temple. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. Uh, what, what he sees is religious people using a system of worship uh, to, to take advantage and abuse the poor. What's going on here? He's frustrated. I told you he had a, he had a rough week. He, he's coming in and he knows what's going on in the heart. Steps off the colt, goes in the temple, and then he finds people abusing other people in the name of religion, and he gets ticked off. And the Bible says is that he weaves a whip. My, my dad didn't weave a whip, but he, brum, brum, you know, he, he, that's what Jesus, you know, what, what do you do with Jesus? Uh, uh, and he's, he's weaving a whip. And then he, he's so upset that he, he turns tables over in, in the house of God. You're, you're, it's to be a house of prayer. It's to be a place where God is worshiped so close. But yet when you're so close to something, it's easier to miss the treasure. Then he goes, and of course he goes to bed that, that day, and uh, he, he gets up and he's hungry, he needs some breakfast, uh, and, and he, he, uh, it's not a good week for him, he's hungry, he goes to, to the fig tree, and there's no figs, only leaves, and he kills it instantly. And you get this idea that embedded in a world, in an environment that should be bearing fruit, there's no fruit to be bare. And I look at this as a figure of example of you're supposed to be producing, but you're not producing. And Jesus is so irritated at this moment, he just kills the fig tree. In a world that's supposed to be and is not, the closer you are to the treasure, the easier it can be to miss it. And of course, we run on to the last moment before we enter the parables as the chief priests and the elders question him. What authority do you have? What, what authority do you have? And he says, okay, if I answer your, if I ask, if, you're, if I'm going to answer that, then I'm going to ask you a question. you got to give me an answer. And they did. And, and they were trying to discredit him with all these questions. And here is Jesus saying, I've done signs and wonders. I've healed the blind, made the lame walk. I've done incredible things with the little boy's lunch right in front of your eyes. And you still don't believe me. And you're to be the people that should be the first ones to accept me because of what you've seen with your eyes. You should believe in your your heart and Jesus is frustrated. I'll tell you, the closer you are to the treasure, the easier it is to miss. And, and I look at this and, and then he goes and he tells three stories. And this is a Jesus thing to do, of course. This is what Jesus does. And, 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 and you want to really pay attention when Jesus says three things in a row. 
right? I mean, if it's not the first time he's done this, Luke 15, he talks about salvation and he talks about the lost coin, the lost son, and the lost sheep, three in a row. He, he, uh, he, another time he talks Matthew 25, he's asked what's the end of the world going to be like when Christ, you know, uh, what's it going to be like? And, and then he talks about, he quotes Daniel and the abomination of desolation and the day or the hour is not known. And, and, and then he says three parables, the virgins, the talents, the sheep and the goats. On the Sermon on the Mount, uh, he, he talks about who we are to be as the church, that you're to be uh, a light on a stand, a salt on the earth, a salt of the earth, and a city on a hill. Three things. When the Savior of the world says things three times in a row, pay attention. But pay attention, and, and, and that's what we're doing today. And he is talking in this moment to religious people. And, and in our day, it would be people who grew up with great exposure to church and to Christ. It'd be that, that's the type of people, and, and it's the people that the Bible, that have had Bible verses read to them when they were little. That maybe perhaps your parents brought you every week to church, maybe even midweek, and you're like, can I just stay home? And sometimes these people would fake sick so they could stay home. And, and, and he, it's like, you, you, and here's what's interesting is, 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 what he's basically saying is, what is wrong with you? Like you had a head start. Like you had a, an advantage being exposed to the things of God. You had an opportunity that nobody else had, that few people have had. You grew up so close to this thing. Like what, what's going on with you that, that, that you're even living in the blessing of a parental unit who grew you up in church and you don't even know how blessed you are because of the environment that your parents raised you in and here you are and you're so close, but you're missing the treasure. That you're searching far and wide and I would say this, even if you didn't grow up in a Christian home, you did grow up in America. By the way, a lot of the experiences that you and I have in the, in the prosperity and blessing of this nation came as a result of people who made Christ their Savior. And so just understand that the place you live, the car you drive, the blessings that you receive are a direct derivative of a God who gave you a head start. That's the deal. In America, where God two times a year stops the world and celebrates Christmas, a virgin birth. An empty tomb at Easter. And, and, and I would tell you, is it ama amazing how we have so much exposure and we're so close. But the closer you are to the treasure, the easier it is to miss. And that, that, that the tendency is, is to look far and wide. Only to find that what you're looking for is right in your hand or under your feet. So he tells three parables. Here we are. Uh, number one is he, he talks about the, the two sons. We're gonna, here, let's go ahead and read it. Matthew 21. Here's what it says. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went uh, to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. Verse 29, he says, I will not. You didn't know your kids were in the Bible, did you? Uh, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they are. So am I. Uh, he answered. <laughs> but later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and did the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. And Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors, listen to this, and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe. You see, Jesus used this parable to expose the hard-heartedness of a religious crowd that did not recognize or think they needed a Savior that they were to repent and humble themselves before God. It is mind-blowing. And I look at this today, and the first son changed his mind. The Bible says that he repented. He was going in one direction, 
and he turned and went the other direction. This is the ultimate goal for Christ in our lives, that we would repent, that we would change our mind, that we would change our life and change our direction. But the second son didn't. He said yes to the father's face and didn't follow through. He did his own thing. The Bible says that he did not go. I'm going to do what I want with who I want, how I want, where I want. I'm the boss. I'm the leader. And I look at this and I'm saying that intention is not a decision. And, and, and Christ, as he does, is bringing people to a decision. And I would tell you that you're not responsible for what you hear, but what you do. And, and I'm looking at that and, and I'm saying, man, sadly, both sons heard, but one decided and one decided to not go. And, and I, I look at what Christ is doing, and the more a person hears something, the more resistant they become to it, or the less they are challenged by it. And, and the, the tragedy of about the closer you are to the treasure, the more likely you are, to, the easier it is to miss it, is because it's the redundancy of our lives. That many times that, that we've heard the Father, we've heard the gospel, we've heard about Jesus, but yet the, it's growing a numbness in our hearts to where it's easier and easier to reject. Ephesians 4.18 says this, there, it talks about a hard heart will cost me life on earth. Their, their minds are full of darkness. They wandered far from the life of God. Isn't it true that God has given us and desires for, to give us what John 10.10 10 calls a rich and satisfying life. And over and over again you hear that Christ will take you to better places. And this son, one does repent but the other rejects. Isn't it interesting in our lives? What you do with the truth is crucial. Jesus then compares them to the worst of the worst in their mind. The prostitute and the tax collectors. And because those worst people accepted Christ. That theirs is the kingdom of heaven and they're entering because they did repent. And you can't get any closer to Jesus than feeling the breath of his voice in your face. Here, here's these religious leaders and they're hearing and, and they don't even maybe recognize that the Christ, the savior of the world, is pleading with them. And he's pleading for them to not have a hard heart but to come to himself, and, 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 and here's what I wrote down, it's crazy proximity, so close, but so far away, almost, but not enough. You see, here's the reality, the closer you are to the treasure, the easier it can be to miss, and here, here's what I would say, that the parable of the two sons, repent or refuse, it's, it's, it's just, that, that, that's that simple. Here, here's the second story is, the, the tenants, and I would call this crazy patience. Here, here he tells another one, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. And he put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his, his servants. They beat one, killed another. And stoned a third. That's not, but that's, okay, you get that? That's not, but that's, okay, just to clarify. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. In this parable, it's interesting because the landowner represents, of course, Christ or God. The vineyard is the kingdom of heaven. We understand that the wicked servants are specifically the leaders he's talking to, but in a bigger picture, those who reject him. The servants are God's prophets and faithful believers through the years. That, that even before this story, that God has sent servant and prophet, and that's the whole Old Testament. And that's all of what God did, sending messengers for them to get it and to experience Jesus. The beloved son, of course, is, is Jesus Christ. And the new tenants are you and I, and Jesus sees the rejection of truth. And these religious leaders function strictly out of tradition. They had no true love for God, and God sent a prophet after prophet, teacher after teacher. And then finally, the landowner sends his son, his one and only son, and the owner has crazy patience, first sending servants, send one, Sent, beat one, sent another one, killed that one, st st stoned a third, not, but, not, but, you know what I mean? Then another time it says he sent servants again, more than the first time. 
be killed, stoned again. Then he gives the ultimate, his son. And I I would tell you, how many people has God sent into your life? How many people has God sent into your life? How many preachers and how many pastors and how many teachers and how many friends? How many people has God sent into your life? But isn't it interesting, the closer you are to the treasure, the easier it is to miss. Here's what the, the Bible says, the Lord is not slow in doing what he promised, 2 Peter 3, 9, the way people understand slowness, but God is patient with you. See, crazy patience. I mean, think about the vineyard and the kingdom of God that God wants us, that, we're, that God wants us to experience in our lives, the kingdom of God, the kingdom being that, that, that bringing wholeness to us. Chasing out the chaos, and here in this story we have the vineyard, and and God is pleading with them in that moment back then when Jesus told this story by sending person after person. But that, that, then the Bible says, look at this, that that he he said, you know what? He'll bring the wretches to a wretched end, verse forty one, and he'll rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. That, that, that he had crazy patience, but at some point he'll may, he'll he'll stop asking. And that you and I, now, we look at what he was saying then, and he said, you know what, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm tired of what's going on. I'm tired of the rejection. Even Christ gets frustrated. He says, I'm going to give it to new tenants. And you and I are the new tenants. And we have to make a decision what we're going to do with Christ. And look at this, verse 45. I don't have this on the screen, but it says, when the chief priest and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parable, they knew he was talking about them. Did you get that? Religious people, leaders, they knew what was going on. They they knew that he was trying to reach them. You can't even get more patient in this moment than God was. And how many times, how many people, how many friends, how many presentations do we have of the gospel? And he's, he's frustrated with what they're doing. He says, finally, he comes to a point in his life where we see in the New Testament that he shook, shook the dust off his feet. Which was a practice that these people aren't receiving what, what you're saying. So you got to move on. You got to move past the, the unwilling to the willing. We're the new tenants. We have the same opportunity. God wants us to r- surrender. Here's the parable of tenants accept or reject. Here's the warning the closer you are to the treasure, the easier it can be to miss. Here's the third story is the banquet, crazy persistence. This is what I'm going to tell you. You see that proximity. Like so close, but yet so far away. Crazy patience. Here we have a vineyard, a guy continuing to send people to bring the message, to get them to change. Even his own son. But they put him to death in hopes that they'll be able to keep the vineyard for themselves. And here is the picture of of the ultimate land over God sending his son. Crazy patience. But then we see this last one, the banquet. Crazy persistence. Here, Here it is. Matthew 22. Verse 1 through 5 is that that Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. And and he, he sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. So what would happen is when, when a prince uh, or anybody would have a wedding, they would send a save the date. Send out servants and say, hey, it's going to be somewhere in August that we're going to come. And then they would kind of lump off that, that season. And then they would resend those same servants to say, it's going to be August 15th at 5 in the afternoon. Please come. So, so there's automatic a save the day. And that's exactly. But they refused to come. Then he sent more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I prepared my dinner my oxen and fattened calf. Yes, God loves meat. Thank you, Jesus. And I've been butchered and everything's ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid mo- no attention and they went off. One to his field and another to his business. Here's what's awesome. The king invites people. He, he does. He, he's sending out a save today, then servants to go out to give a time. And he, verse 4 says he sends servants, but they refuse to come. Here's what verse 4 says. He sent more servants, but they paid No attention. How persistent is that God would send multiple invitations? How how persistent? Multiple invitations. I I would love to know the the amount of of 
invitations in my life, in my ministry, or even in the 10 years at this church, how many invitations that I've given from this platform to lost people. Invitation after invitation. Invitation that that God continues to invite us to a feast. I mean, come on, that, 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 that you look at what's going on here. And the picture of what happened then, that it was the social, uh, so, social event of like, like probably the year, if not the decade, if not a lifetime. And, and, but yet the, 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 the counterpart in the other gospel says, one said I bought an ox, ox and I got to go try him out. One says I just got married and can't come. Excuse after excuse after excuse, but yet the king continues to persist. And I'm going to tell you, the feast is good. The feast that God gives you, you and I, is good. And so many people are like, man, I want peace. And they search far and wide for peace. Man, they look and and, and there's nothing that compares to the greatness of serving Christ. He is giving you a feast. Like a feast. What's he give me? Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, kindness, self-control. That's unbelievable. I find peace at the lake. I love like, that's awesome. It's peaceful for five minutes until the moron next to you starts feeding the seagulls. And here's how Paul said it. This is what he says, that, that everything else is worthless compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ. That look, man, I'm going to tell you, you can, be the, you can get every pleasure and everything that you think you want, but it's nothing compared to the feast. Man, the feast is incredible. It's life-changing. It's truly what you're looking for, but the closer you are to the treasure, the easier it is to miss. And I think, you know... I, I just think sometimes that we think that a Hot Pocket and, and like binging Netflix is where it's at. And I'm thinking that's not where it's at. I don't think that we want too much. I just think it's that we want too little. Look at the rest of the story. There comes a time when the invitation's over. He asks and asks and asks, but eventually there's a last ask. Matthew 22, here's what it says. He gets really upset. The servants, the rest, he, uh, seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The ones that went out, they, 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 they killed them. It's the same scenario there that, that's the picture of, of what God has sent over the years in his ancestors. And they have rejected the, the message. They have rejected the gospel. Verse 7, the king was enraged and he sent his army and destroyed those murders and burned the city. Then he said to the servants, the wedding banquet is ready. But those I invited did not come. So go to the street corners and invite them to the banquet, anyone you can find. I love this. So the servants went out into the the streets and gathered all the people they could find. Look at this. The bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. See, see, I love that, that, that he so bad wanted a full house in honor of his son that that he, he stops asking them in fact, they killed his son, but he's going to continue to ask the bad and the good. And, and I would tell you that the, the reason why we have an invite-centered year this year is because the king asks us to. The reason why we're like, invite your friends is because God wants a full house. That it his, It's his desire that not any perish, but all come to repentance. It's his initiative that we're doing, right? Now look at the rest of this, and I'll tell you this, this next part bothers commentators and preachers. It's rough. It would be like, woohoo, confetti, if it stopped there, but it's not confetti, it's serious. Look at what's said next. But when the king came to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. And he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Obviously, he's talking about hell. Then look at this, for many are invited, but few are chosen. In other words, everybody is invited, but people still won't change. And and I look at this, the house is packed, the king walks up to a guy who doesn't have the right clothes on, and he said, how did you get in here? And he has nothing to say, he is speechless. 
in this time, when you would attend a wedding, you would go in wedding clothes. Like oftentimes a white robe or a garment, and people would have their wedding garment that they would put on. But because they were poor, or because they came right from the street, they didn't have the right clothes. And the inference in scripture is that the king provided the requisite clothes for them to put on. It's truly a picture of salvation. And here is a guy who's like, I don't need that. And he keeps his street clothes on. And the picture is, is that he doesn't put on the newness of Christ, taking off his old life. See, he thinks it's okay to live in his own righteousness, in his own good deeds. See, the Bible says that you're in my righteousness is like filthy rags. That's why we, we, it's, not, it's not about just being good enough to get into the kingdom of God. The guy was good enough and he got kicked out. It's not about being good enough. It's about having a complete change where you put Jesus on as you take off the old life. And here we are, and I think so many times that we're so close. He was so close. Like he's so close to being with the, like in the presence of the wedding banquet. But the closer you are to the treasure, the easier it is to miss it. There are people who won't. There are people who kind of will. And, and I look at this and I'm like, and I'm looking at my own life and I'm like, have you been a fan of Jesus on your own terms? Or are you a follower of Jesus on his terms? See, it's not about doing good and, and, and Jesus being your homeboy. And I know there's so many people that they're okay with Jesus. Man, I'm cool, Jesus. I, I mean, I like what Jesus does for my kids and helps you know, me raise them in, with values. And I, 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 like, I, got, I like church. I get friends. I have got a date once, and she was really cute from church. I like church. I learn stuff. But the parable of, of the banquet is, it's not about being cool with him, it's being changed by him. It's about having a, a changed life. And I'm like, God, help me to change my life. Here's what Charles Spurgeon says. This man, speaking of this guy with the, the cl wrong clothes on, because he, he was invited, he came only in appearance. The banquet was intended to honor the king's son, but this man knew nothing of the kind. He was willing to eat the good things set before him, but his, in his heart there was no love either for the king or his well-beloved son. Here, here's the point, that he wanted the gifts, but not the giver. That he wanted the blessings without the blesser. That he wanted Christmas without the manger. That he wanted the Easter without the empty tomb. That he wanted all the benefits of the food and the oxen and the banquet, but not honoring the son. Just say, God, the closer you are to the treasure, the easier it can be to miss. And the whole objective there is it's not about your righteousness and good deeds that's going to get you there. It's so close. It's about having a transformation in your heart and your mind. It's, it's about change. And, and I look at that and, and I say, man, buried treasure, a great pearl. Man, three parables then. Jesus speaks to a group of people that are close but are completely missing it. When the Savior repeats things three times, we got to listen. Man, so close to the treasure, but yet so far away, completely missing it. Here's what Romans 1.20 says, that for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they, they can see his invisible qualities, his, his eternal power and divine nature. Look at this. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. The reality is in your life and in my life, man, that, that God has done everything he can do for us not to miss it, but we have to be willing not to miss it. There's a phenomenon um, where the Amazon, in South America, where the Amazon River runs into the Atlantic Ocean. Booker T. Washington tells this story of an old ship back in the day that these guys were sailing and they, they finally ran out of good drinking water. And they, they would use flags to communicate to, to other ships because they didn't have the technology in those days that we do today. And they saw a, a ship come over the horizon and they sent this message, they communicated this message, um, need help, need water. And, and the response back with the flags from the ship far away was, 
let down your bucket. The, the, the captain was like, man, I think they misunderstood. Send them again. Send the message again. Need help, need water. And again, the message came back, let down your bucket. And they're like, this is crazy. I guess we'll just let down our bucket. They let down the bucket. They pulled up the clearest, greatest drinking water. And what's interesting is for 200 miles, because what happens is, is the Amazon River goes into the Atlantic Ocean. It pushes the heavy salt water down, all the while clearing up the water on top. And it's some of the best, coolest, greatest water to drink. And for 200 miles, we're over clear, drinkable water, but all they needed to do was let down their nets. They were so close to the treasure, but yet how somehow they missed it. And I would tell you today, you can go and search far and wide, but the kingdom, when you get it, you'll sell everything to have it. And it's the true value. It's the real thing. And man, you know, we could spend all our lives looking for the person or looking for the finances or looking for something special to make me feel good, all the while missing the feast that God has for us. All the while, the vineyard that has grapes and, and provision, all the while missing a relationship with the Father and obedience, all the while missing it. Would you grab your connect card? I want our altar team to come, prayer team to come. Let's look at this. Number one, today I decide this is the way that I'm asking you to respond today. Four possible ways. Number one, today I decided to, I decide to follow Jesus for the first time. And, and I'm, I told you, my number one goal is if you don't know Christ today, is to bring you the gospel. Once again, the Father in heaven sends you an invitation. The King is inviting you once again. Once again, he is sending, talking about the vineyard, servants. Once again, he's bringing his son in front of you. What will you do with him? Once again, breathing on the leaders and, and so close, presenting the gospel to repent and to change once again. But today is a day of decision. See, it's not about intention, it's about deciding. It's not about what you hear, it's about what you do. And the question has been presented, what will you do with the Christ? And today, if you're here and you decide to make that decision yours, I want you to check that box. Number two is here's the second way is I don't want to miss the treasure and not know Jesus. And, and I'll tell you that this is also, as it is for the unbeliever, it is for the believer. Because the tendency in our lives is to get numb to the things of God and to miss it and to get hard-hearted even as believers. And the challenge, again, is to be sobered about the Father's love for us and to be once again captivated by his patience, his persistence, and how close he wants to be, his pro proximity, that he wants to not just have me around, but he wants to know me deeply. So I would check this today. I don't want to miss the treasure. I don't. I don't want to miss the treasure. You can, have a, you can be a preacher and still miss the treasure. Number three, please sign me up for water baptism on July 3rd. And then lastly, my next step is, here's what I feel in. I want to challenge you today to make a next step. Stand with me in this place, would you? I told you today it's a sobering day. We're going to laugh a lot in this parable series. It's going to be awesome. Last week we talked about what happens when you don't think God's answering prayer and the parable, the mustard seed. But today is a day of eternity. It's a serious day. It's a day where God pulls up uh, proverbially and, and, and pulls us up by our bootstraps and says, what are you doing? What are you thinking? What's going on right here? So I'm going to pray for you, and then the worship team is going to lead. And when God's done with you, you're free to go. I'm not going to dismiss you. We know that. If you're new with us today, I'd love to connect with you in the connect room. I have a gift for you. If you need ministry, come down here. And I want all of us to respond and, and bring these to the blue bins in the back to drop these off. I'm so proud of you. So, Father, we love you today. Thank you for your incredible persistence and patience and desire to be close to us. God, thank you for that. We love you. Jesus.
Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling.
Jesus Christ.